Yes, you can understand entropy, the Ray Stat Quest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to Stat Quest. Today we're going to talk about entropy for data science and it's going to be clearly explained. Note, this stat quest assumes that you are already familiar with the main ideas of expected values. If not, check out the quest. Entropy is used for a lot of things in data science. For example, entropy can be used to build classification trees, which are used to classify things. Entropy is also the basis of something called mutual information, which quantifies the relationship between two things. And entropy is the basis of relative entropy, aka the kolbeck liebler distance, and cross-entropy, which show up all over the place, including fancy dimension reduction algorithms like t and UMAP. What these three things have in common is that they all use entropy, or something derived from it, to quantify similarities and differences. So let's learn how entropy quantifies similarities and differences. However, in order to talk about entropy, first we have to understand surprise. So let's talk about chickens. Imagine we had two types of chickens, orange and blue, and instead of just letting them randomly roam all over the screen, our friend Statsquatch chased them around until they were organized into three separate areas, A, B, and C. Now, if Statsquatch just randomly picked up a chicken in area A, then, because there are six orange chickens and only one blue chicken, there is a higher probability that they will pick up an orange chicken. And since there is a higher probability of picking up an orange chicken, it would not be very surprising if they did. In contrast, if Statsquatch picked up the blue chicken from area A, we would be relatively surprised. Area B has a lot more blue chickens than orange. And because there is now a higher probability of picking up a blue chicken, we would not be very surprised if it happened. And because there is a relatively low probability of picking the orange chicken, that would be relatively surprising. Lastly, Area C has an equal number of orange and blue chickens. Thus, regardless of what color chicken we pick up, we would be equally surprised. Combined, these areas tell us that surprise is, in some way, inversely related to probability. In other words, when the probability of picking up a blue chicken is low, the surprise is high. And when the probability of picking up a blue chicken is high, the surprise is low. Bam! Now we have a general intuition of how probability is related to surprise. Now let's talk about how to calculate surprise. Because we know there is a type of inverse relationship between probability and surprise, it's tempting to just use the inverse of probability to calculate surprise. Because when we plot the inverse, we see that the closer the probability is to zero, the larger the y-axis value. However, there is at least one problem with just using the inverse of the probability to calculate surprise. To get a better sense of this problem, let's talk about the surprise associated with flipping a coin. Imagine we had a terrible coin, and every time we flipped it, we got heads. Blah, 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 blah. Ugh. Flipping this coin is super boring. Hey Statsquatch, how surprised would you be if the next flip gave us heads? I would not be surprised at all. So, when the probability of getting heads is 1, then we want the surprise for getting heads to be 0. However, when we take the inverse of the probability of getting heads, we get 1 instead of what we want, 0. And this is one reason why we can't just use the inverse of the probability to calculate surprise. So, instead of just using the inverse of the probability to calculate surprise, we use the log of the inverse of the probability. Now, since the probability of getting heads is 1, and thus we will always get heads and it will never surprise us, the surprise for heads is 0. In contrast, 
Since the probability for getting tails is zero, and thus we'll never get tails, it doesn't make sense to quantify the surprise of something that will never happen. So when we plug in zero for the probability, and use the properties of logs to turn the division into subtraction, the second term is the log of zero. And because the log of zero is undefined, the whole thing is undefined. And this result is okay, because we're talking about the surprise associated with something that never happens. Like the inverse of the probability, the log of the inverse of the probability gives us a nice curve. And the closer the probability gets to zero, the more surprise we get. But now the curve says there is no surprise when the probability is one. So surprise is the log of the inverse of the probability. Bam! Note, when calculating surprise for two outputs, in this case, the two outputs are heads and tails, then it is customary to use the log base 2 for the calculations. Now that we know what surprise is, let's imagine that our coin gets heads 90% of the time, and it gets tails 10% of the time. Now let's calculate the surprise for getting heads and tails. As expected, because getting tails is much rarer than getting heads, the surprise for tails is much larger. Now let's flip this coin three times, and we get heads, heads, and tails. The probability of getting two heads and one tail is 0.9 times 0.9 for the heads times 0.1 for the tails. And if we want to know exactly how surprising it is to get two heads and one tail, then we can plug this probability into the equation for surprise and use the properties of logs to convert the division into subtraction, and use the properties of logs to convert the multiplication into addition, and then plug and chug, and we get 3.62. But more importantly, we see that the total surprise for a sequence of coin tosses is just the sum of the surprises for each individual toss. In other words, the surprise for getting one heads is 0.15, and since we got two heads, we add 0.15 two times, plus 3.32 for the one tail, to get the total surprise for getting two heads and one tail. Medium bam. Now, because this diagram takes up a lot of space, let's summarize the information in a table. The first row in the table tells us the probability of getting heads or tails. And the second row tells us the associated surprise. Now, if we wanted to estimate the total surprise after flipping the coin 100 times, we approximate how many times we will get heads by multiplying the probability we will get heads, 0.9, by 100. And we estimate the total surprise from getting heads by multiplying by 0.15. So this term represents how much surprise we expect from getting heads in 100 coin flips. Likewise, we can approximate how many times we will get tails by multiplying the probability we will get tails, 0.1, by 100 and we estimate the total surprise from getting tails by multiplying by 3.32. So the second term represents how much surprise we expect from getting tails in 100 coin flips. Now we can add the two terms together to find out the total surprise, and we get 46.7. Hey, Statsquatch is back. Okay, I see that we just estimated the surprise for 100 coin flips. But aren't we supposed to be talking about entropy? Funny you should ask. If we divide everything by the number of coin tosses, 100, then we get the average amount of surprise per coin toss, 0.47. So, on average, we expect the surprise to be 0.47 every time we flip the coin. And that is the entropy of the coin the expected surprise every time we flip the coin. Double bam! In fancy statistics notation, we say that entropy is the expected value of the surprise. Anyway, 
since we are multiplying each probability by the number of coin tosses, 100, and also dividing by the number of coin tosses, 100, then all of the values that represent the number of coin tosses, 100, cancel out. And we are left with the probability that a surprise for heads will occur times its surprise, plus the probability that a surprise for tails will occur times its surprise. Thus, the entropy, 0 0.47, represents the surprise we would expect per coin toss if we flipped this coin a bunch of times. And yes, expecting surprise sounds silly, but it's not the silliest thing I've heard. Note, we can rewrite entropy just like an expected value using fancy sigma notation. The x represents a specific value for surprise, times the probability of observing that specific value for surprise. So, for the first term, getting heads, the specific value for surprise is 0 0.15, and the probability of observing that surprise is 0 0.9. So we multiply those values together. Then the sigma tells us to add that term to the term for tails. Either way we do the math, we get 0 0.47. Now, personally, once I saw that entropy was just the average surprise that we could expect, entropy went from something that I had to memorize to something I could derive. Because now, we can plug the equation for surprise in for x, the specific value. And we can plug in the probability. And we end up with the equation for entropy. Bam! Unfortunately, even though this equation is made from two relatively easy to interpret terms, the surprise times the probability of the surprise, this isn't the standard form of the equation for entropy that you'll see out in the wild. First, we have to swap the order of the two terms. Then we use the properties of logs to convert the fraction into subtraction. And the log of 1 is 0. Then we multiply both terms in the difference by the probability. Then, lastly, we pull the minus sign out of the summation. And we end up with the equation for entropy that Claude Shannon first published in 1948. Small bam. That said, even though this is the original version and the one you'll usually see, I prefer this version since it is easily derived from surprise and it is easier to see what is going on. Now, going back to the original example, we can calculate the entropy of the chickens. So let's calculate the entropy for area A. Because six of the seven chickens are orange, we plug in six divided by seven for the probability. Then we add a term for the one blue chicken by plugging in one divided by seven for the probability. Now we just do the math and get 0 0.59. Note, even though the surprise associated with picking up an orange chicken is much smaller than picking up a blue chicken, there is a much higher probability that we will pick up an orange chicken than pick up a blue chicken. Thus, the total entropy, 0 0.59, is much closer to the surprise associated with orange chickens than blue chickens. Likewise, we can calculate the entropy for area B. Only this time, the probability of randomly picking up an orange chicken is 1 divided by 11, and the probability of picking up a blue chicken is 10 divided by 11, and the entropy is 0 0.44. In this case, the surprise for picking up an orange chicken is relatively high, but the probability of it happening is so low that the total entropy is much closer to the surprise associated with picking up a blue chicken. We also see that the entropy value, the expected surprise, is less for area B than area A. This makes sense because area B has a higher probability of picking a chicken with a lower surprise. Lastly, the entropy for area C is 1. And that makes the entropy for area C the highest we have calculated so far. 
In this case, even though the surprise for orange and blue chickens is relatively moderate, one, we always get the same, relatively moderate, surprise every time we pick up a chicken. And it is never outweighed by a smaller value for surprise like we saw earlier for areas A and B. As a result, we can use entropy to quantify the similarity or difference in the number of orange and blue chickens in each area. Entropy is highest when we have the same number of both types of chickens. And as we increase the difference in the number of orange and blue chickens, we lower the entropy. Triple BAM! P.S. The next time you want to surprise someone, just whisper. The log of the inverse of the probability. Bam. Now it's time for some... Shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest study guides at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs or a t-shirt or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!